I'm not sure how many of us out there understand what the word CRISPR actually means. So perhaps we should start off by defining that. Reese, do you want to go with that first? Sure. Where CRISPR comes from, it's uh, the memory and immune systems from bacteria, from yeah, microbes, from e. right. of, of how they recognize an infection from something uh, and, and cut it up, basically. And so CRISPR stands for uh, uh, Clustered Regularly Interspaced Palindromic Repeats, which is not useful to remember. <laughs> um, in that, but it, it, it's a way of reading the DNA finding, uh, recognizing something that might be a virus code that's been inserted uh, or, or is free floating, uh, cutting it or, or uh, uh, sticking it somewhere else. And, and it's, it is the immune system from microbes. And so it's been used to read the DNA in, in mammals and, and plants and other creatures, find a piece of DNA that you want to cut, uh, to uh, insert maybe a, a change or a, a new segment. So you can change a gene that does one thing into a gene that does something else or, or repair a code that, that is wrong. And so the question that we were talking about in the hallway is, well, what is the blockchain equivalent of this? And Because there's a malignant element here that, you know, that we're exploiting when we're doing it in medicine and in, um, in genetics. So is there an equivalent of this on the blockchain? And who would be exploiting, exploiting it, do you think? Yeah. And so it, it's, uh, it's probably not been invented yet for blockchain. And, and we were talking at, at breakfast about whether a, a quantum computer decrypting the code uh, of the hashes in a blockchain uh, would be something that could scan the blockchain like CRISPR, find the transaction that you want to change, decrypt it, make the change, re-encrypt it, uh, which is computationally not possible now, uh, but maybe with uh, m uh, more powerful computers. And a crypto expert who was at breakfast, who will be on a panel later, uh, said, well, that's possible maybe in 20 years. Um, and so we'll hear more about that later. Yeah. He, I mean, we thought it was probably about 20 years away, but, um, and that was on an optimistic, on, on the optimistic side. But, Yeah, okay. so, um, but about 20 years, um, uh, one of my friends came to my kitchen. I often gather 50 friends at my kitchen and said, oh, oh today I just uh, kind of cut a head of my client and put it into fridge uh, to store it for 100 years until people invent a way to cure kind of illness and to put this head into a new body. So it's um, Crionica. Crionica. So my, yes, right. my friends just uh, have a side business. It's not his primary to freeze people for 100 years. <laughs> He's not sure that um, kind of um, this freezing is not damaging brain because this technology is not uh, kind of well tested. However, for people who kind of don't have other way other than just try this or die immediately, they kind of uh, provide a good client flow for him. I actually will buy uh, kind of um, a, disc a discounted um, ticket for this service for entire body. So if you remember me, you will unfreeze uh, and uh, uh, or decide to forget. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, so. so I feel you want to, to add, huh? Sure. Um, here's the thing. Uh, really, what we're trying to do here is link the blockchain to something else, which is human patterns, human patterns of memory, human patterns of thinking, and human patterns of DNA. Uh, so that's where the CRISPR comes in. That's the DNA. That's where what he mentioned, how we become immortal, comes in. That's actually the human mind, the human memory, the way we think. We are all just patterns, really, and patterns are just data. The thing that blockchain does really well is maintain the veracity of the data, maintain the ownership of the data. The blockchain itself is non-repudiable, which means that you know exactly who owns what, and 
the blockchain itself as a technology that allows data to also own data. That is basically where I see blockchain in immortality, in, in actually helping us uh, achieve that, uh, not just technology, but that framework of uh, creating immortal humans. And that's what I think uh, is, is the end goal for all of us humanity is to, for me, <laughs> even avoid death if possible. Yeah, and what is interesting uh, that one of the user cases for blockchain in a new project mm -hmm. is to store information about um, uh, data con uh, connected of DNA of a person with his uh, medical records. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is used, there are millions of uh, persons, mm -hmm. and uh, this is used to find correlation and find uh, which letter of DNA mm -hmm. uh, is responsible for a certain type of illness or a human kind of uh, characteristic, such as brain size or mm -hmm. muscles or color yeah. or skin care or anything else but the issue becomes what do you do once you find what those genetic coding is for your brain size skin color etc do you you know are we in a position to try to change them mm -hmm. is that what we're trying to do you know part of um, Reese's comments earlier on was that um, in biology at least we have the, the idea of diversity and natural, Darwinian natural selection. So where does that, what does that mean for, for the blockchain mm -hmm. in particular? You know, is that going to be um, a question of, for example, usage of electricity? Is it security? Is it the amount of capital? Are energy. those the mm -hmm. energy or are those the kind of things that are gonna force the natural selection of blockchain? Yeah. Which one would you say was be the most uh, pressing factor? Because you know, obviously, apart from a solar flare or a major mm -hmm. crackdown on the energy exchange, I don't. Energy may not be the one. Is it the amount of capital? I mean, we've seen the amount of capital going into blockchain has been enormous. Well, well, something that would be catastrophic for blockchain in general is if somebody were to uh, break the cryptography um, uh, technique. Right in that where people would lose faith or lose trust in its ability to uh, process the truth. And so that hasn't happened in 10 years and, and the architecture is mathematically sound and doesn't look like it's likely to happen, but there are many um, what they call zero day discoveries from hackers that figure out ways to get around the architecture that is seemingly sound, like recently happened with the Intel chip designs. Right, right, right. And so uh, that's not likely to happen to blockchain, and but it, it could. And one of the protections for that is to have many different flavors of blockchain. And so that maybe uh, happens to one flavor, but not all the flavors. So that's where diversity becomes very important um, in terms of the security and stability of the whole system. With that analogy though, the quantum computer would cause a ma mass extinction event for most of the blockchains, like even the quantum proof ones. Like we don't have quantum computers yet, so we don't really know uh, if they are, like it's not been tested in the field yet. Um, I feel that in terms of this discussion, uh, the, 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 the intersection between what we call CRISPR, Cas9, and uh, quantum computing is really strong because the way we can edit the blockchain, the way we can change what the blockchain, what your blockchain stands for means that in effect, we can get your tokens, <laughs> we can get your money. So that's, that's what I think about it basically. Well, and you mentioned mass extinctions and one of, uh, an example mass extinction is when the asteroid hit that killed the, uh, everything that was big or couldn't hide under a rock or didn't have fur or didn't have feathers. So it killed all the dinosaurs, for example, and only the, what were sort of the rodent and, rodent. and chicken equivalents survived. And so- You mean the mammals? Well, chicken, well, chickens, chickens yeah, that's yeah. true. I forgot. Which are dinosaurs. direct descendants of the dinosaurs. But the, uh, uh, 
but that was some, a mass extinction that affected certain characteristics of things, of, of if they were large, if they couldn't uh, uh, warm themselves, if, uh, and, and so uh, maybe 90% of the species that existed at that time were wiped out, but 10% did survive. But the ones that did survive were, were pretty different than the ones that, that went extinct. So and so that could happen to, uh, to software, it could happen to blockchains, it could happen to computers, it could happen to a lot of things that we rely on, like GPS, um, that uh, everything that relies on GPS could be wiped out with one solar flare. And so that kind of thing uh, uh, could happen. And so a little bit of a backup plan needs to be in place for if it does. So um, it looks like uh, we have an option uh, to be freezed and wait when either, uh, I, I mean, if you are going to die, which is not a good thing because you are, so have so many great ideas. It's great if you live longer, <laughs> of course. Uh, and uh, there are, it looks like just two options. First is to wait until uh, uh, there will be Crips class which can kind of make us live longer, which is edit this program in DNA which kill us. Yes. Yes. So it's, you can go to my friends to his fridge. For, and the second option is also to, to get into fridge and wait when uh, somebody will be able to upload you into blockchain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks a lot. It's a, a very kind of uh, uh, new dim dimension. I think there uh, could be somebody who have also insights to share. Who wants to kind of give his view on biotech? Yeah. Oh. Okay. I, I missed uh, a, a bit of the, the talk, but I presume I did hear a little bit of quantum computing and mm -hmm. using that to break blockchains or public-private keys. Um, this is closer than a lot of people think. I, I, this is a field of mine and it's, it's closer than we all think and there's various other things like Mirai botnets and IoT that give us distributed power to potentially hack the encryption techniques currently on blockchain or certainly asymmetric encryption. In terms of quantum computing, may I ask from the people on the stage, if this is an area that you have experience in, where you see now we're currently deploying lots of applications on the blockchain, and then in five, six years' time, it can all be stolen or all our private keys are gone. What, what solutions are there within your kind of field of study or experience that we can start having you know, essentially quantum resistant ledgers? Well, there, there's two uh, protections that are pretty simple. Which one is um, Bitcoin's blockchain does consume a lot of energy, which means even if you could uh, change a record in it, you would have to uh, have enough computing power using enough electricity to reconstruct the entire blockchain uh, from scratch which uh, the fact that it uses a lot of energy to do that is a protection by itself, and that uh, few people have that much electricity or that much compute power to do it, and those that do tend to not want to be breaking the system. And then the other factor that's, that's built in is that it's a distributed, uh, decentralized system, so uh, the same record is held on thousands of mining nodes or thousands of compute centers. And so if, even if you were to be able to break it and construct a fake blockchain on your local compute center, you would also have to get it propagated onto many thousands or majority, more than half of, uh, of, of other uh, uh, mining nodes. And so those two things, the amount of energy and the distributed nature of it, means that even if you could break the cryptography, you have a, another couple hurdles to get over to be able to actually compromise the overall system. Do you need the mic? Do you need the mic? Right, and so that, that's the point of saying uh, have some extra 
secure systems and some more anonymous systems and some differently distributed systems and some different methods of, of encrypting and, and uh, you know, different proofs of, of uh, state, whether instead of proof of work, you change to proof of space and time or, or proof of you know, ownership. That, so if you have several different systems, maybe one of them gets hacked, but the others uh, survive. So it's like okay, one okay, species next, going extinct. Um, do you think there is a Satoshi Nakamoto to life who could actually edit our DNAs to make us live forever? Well, yeah, is there a Satoshi Nakamoto for Biotech who invented uh, editing to live forever, right? Yeah, so the key is uh, what is the realistic option to um, get us living forever now that we are so living only for so decades? It, it, yeah. I understand. In the life extension community, uh, there's sort of two genres of thinking. There's the meatheads and the gearheads. And the meatheads is how do I have my biological self live forever, either by freezing me or, or fixing what's wrong with me as, as I wear out, uh, and, and reprogramming the code in me that says, you know, puberty now, menopause now, death now that's pre-programmed and it's different for different species, so it's obviously programmed. And the gearheads is how do I transfer me or my consciousness and my essence into the internet? So the gearheads are meatheads and some people want to do both and say keep a biological copy of me going and an electronic copy of me going. And usually their backup plan is to freeze yourself uh, in case uh, we don't figure it out in time. Um, and there's already like a good example of that. Otzi the Iceman who fell in a glacier uh, 5,000 years ago and was frozen and, and they recently found him and thought him out and, uh, and he hasn't come back to life but they're learning a lot of things about him so he's partly back to life. I don't think they were quite thinking of coming back to life as a <laughs> frozen mummy <laughs> being exhibited. But don't we have a, a, a life that exists even now at the moment in the internet? I mean, you know, stuff that That's you store question. on your Facebook, etc., is going to be there forever. So in sense, some sense, the essence of us or the life we have led, the thoughts we have had are pretty much there in perpetuity to a large extent anyway. Uh, absolutely. That, that most of us have uh, electronic personas. Many have many. Um, and for example, your Facebook profile, and you put uh, your opinions and your images and your voice in some cases and videos. And and uh, more and more of your essence is uh, on the internet. And this uh, version of you, the electronic version of you, will outlast the biological version of you. And if you transfer in your daily life more and more of yourself onto the internet, it'll be easier for the internet to construct a more complete version of you with your own personality and your own decision making. And at some stage you can give the electronic version of you a credit card and set it free in the internet and to go out and prosper, uh, where the biological version of you um, is still there and the digital version is free. Uh, out in the world and, and will likely outlast the biological version of you. And beyond the scope of this panel discussion, like where your consciousness is between those two, that's a different, more detailed discussion. 